Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Durkin. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, second session of a Saturday morning of the Brisbane Festival of Ideas. And uh, our guest this morning, our guest speaker, is uh, Mr. Simon McKeon, who is the 2011 Australian of the Year. He's also executive chairman of Macquarie Group's Melbourne office. He's the chairman of the CSIRO and uh, Business for Millenni Millennium Development. Simon's the director of the Vision Fund, World Vision's international microcredit arm, and the Global po Poverty Project and Red Dust Role Models. He's an Australia Day ambassador for the Victorian government and serves on the federal government's Human Rights Grant Scheme Advisory Panel and the Victorian government's NDIS Implement Implementation Task Force. He previously served as founding president of the federal government's Australian Takeovers Panel, founding chairman of MS Research Australia, and founding president of the federal government's Point Nepean Community Trust. Simon is the helmsman of, Australia, of Macquarie Innovation, which in March 2009 became the first sailboat uh, in the world to sustain, sustain more than 50 knots, and in so doing peaked at a speed of 100 kilometres an hour, which is 54 knots. I've no idea what that means. It sounds terrifying, and he may describe it to us. He's also a patron of the Australian Olympic sailing team, which won two gold and a silver medal at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Simon's topic this morning is Inclusive Australia. Is there a place for profit in social enterprise? And I'm told by Simon that essentially he'll be discussing for us this morning the crossover between business and well-being. So would you please welcome Mr. Simon McKeon. Thanks very much, um, Anthony. And can I just say right at the outset, the wonderful thing about these sessions is that uh, I think I'm, in, I'm allowed to talk for 35 or so minutes. And if none of that is of interest to you, we then have another 20 minutes to talk about really what you do want to talk about. And uh, I don't think it gets any better than that. It's great being here in Queensland. I was actually here right at the beginning of this calendar year. Um, I towed a boat up the Newell Highway, I was going to compete in some national championships up here and arrived to see local headlines of uh, Rockhampton being flooded. We got this championship series out of the way and in a week or so, proceeded back, and it was really quite eerie because as we uh, went over that, what's that pass at the back of Brisbane, you know, that you, on the way to come to Windy or whatever? Over Adelaide. Cunningham. Anyway, Cunningham, that's right. Yeah. Went up over that, and it just started to rain. And all the way out to, to Gundawindi before you turn south towards Melbourne, in the rear view, rear view vision mirror, there was these just, re there were the darkest clouds I'd ever seen. And it was as if it was just approaching or following us. And, uh, of course, that was the start of the most awful um, floods that then afflicted um, Lockyer Valley, Brisbane. On it went. And then, of course, uh, weeks later, this state had um, Yazi further north. And, um, of course, in this particular region, whether it's our near neighbour New Zealand or, indeed, Japan, a long way away, but still in this similar time zone, we've really been afflicted by, you know, the most extraordinary uh, natural disasters of recent times. Um, if we were to go back five or six years ago, um, we had a, a major tsunami in and around the Indian Ocean, and uh, I can recall Tim Costello, a good friend of mine, flew quickly off to Arche to um, observe what was happening, to monitor, to assess, and to try and work out how the response would unfold. And uh, about 48 hours after he was there, and, and if you may recall, it was one of those things that just got worse as each day went by, and progressively we realised right around that Indian Ocean how um, all sorts of areas, some quite remote and not particularly connected in a communication sense, were just reporting back the, the extraordinary um, horrible situation that they were experiencing. Anyway, a microphone was thrust under Tim's snout at one point and he said, uh, and he was asked, look, you're a minister, you're a reverend, how can your God allow this extraordinary natural disaster, this horrible thing? And uh, he was right in the midst of literally working, you know, 20 hours a day just trying to start to mobilise resources and bring in what was needed and have... And in a very frank, off-the-cuff remark, particularly for, um, for an ordained minister, he said, I can't answer that question. I can't answer that question. Certainly can't answer it now. But what I can say is 
And he used his words very carefully because he knew that he was saying something in the face of tens if not hundreds of thousands of people having lost their lives. He said, but what I do know is that this is a time when humanity really gets to work, when all that is good in humanity actually can come to the surface. Um, just a little, uh, well, just a few weeks ago, um, I was just mentioned uh, I'm chairman of CSIRO, and uh, CSIRO had 20 employees who either lost their homes here in Brisbane or they're otherwise badly damaged. And nowadays, of course, it, it goes without thinking that the, the enlightened employer doesn't just pay their employees a, a weekly paycheck, but when things go wrong in an employee's life, it's to be expected that the employer will take more than a passing interest in that. And it was nice um, from my very distant position as CSIRO chairman based in Melbourne to hear that I think that organisation was appropriately supporting in a way people that had been afflicted by the disaster here. Um, the tiny tokenistic thing that I could do as chairman was actually to change the location of a board meeting that we had a month or two ago to make it happen up here in Brisbane. And we got round the table um, a number of these people that had had uh, first-hand horrible instances and we just talked it through and it was interesting to hear how they either valued or actually had some constructive criticism as how the organisation could have supported them better in their, um, in their hour of need. I do commend, however, the Queensland Government, now as a Victorian, for having, um, I think, you know, led the way in responding to disasters like this. Uh, I think uh, it, it has absolutely shown outstanding leadership, it seems to me anyway, from uh, two state borders south on how to deal with uh, such a disaster that's basically confined to, to a state but clearly has to be seen as a national disaster. And of course, as I understand it, coming out of that though, the Queensland Government has now highlighted, if you like, um, three challenges. It's not living in the past and focusing just on flood damage reconstruction but has posed, and I think this Ideas Festival is very much drawing upon it, three themes being food and sustain... Uh, sorry, the... the um, importance of food security, sustainability generally, and, uh, and happiness. Now, the easy thing for me this morning would have been to go on to CSIRO and said, can someone write me a really nice paper on food security and sustainability? Because that's two of many things that CSIRO does every day of the week in the area of um, food. They, in some areas, absolutely lead the world in food technology. They have for decades, as our farmers would expect, been producing the most uh, resilient productive strains of, of wheat. They've produced uh, an extraordinary thing called Barley Max, which is now on supermarket shelves and uh, is a terrific um, cereal. And indeed, uh, in quite some groundbreaking uh, research that's going on at the moment, they're um, using genomics, taking the omega-3 fatty acids that, of course, reside in uh, our marine species uh, and which have been found, of course, to be so important in, in human health, particularly uh, dealing with heart conditions and what have you. But the trouble is that so many of our marine stocks are in dire straits, are, um, are in a bad way, and as our population grows to more than 9 billion, it's actually unrealistic, particularly with an improving, developing world, to expect that we're going to feed ourselves with the sorts of things that uh, marine species so importantly provide to us uh, simply by um, harvesting fish stocks that basically are in decline. And uh, something that really tickles my fancy is what's going on here in, uh, in, in Australia whereby we're actually taking, using as I said before, genomics and uh, injecting into strains of wheat the ability for, uh, for wheat and, and in due course other grains to produce omega-3 fatty acids. I find it particularly exciting because so many people in the world aren't in any way close or proximate to being able to um, have fish in their diet even if they wanted to, but to have it actually produced through um, large-scale agriculture I think is, is exciting. And in the area of sustainability, um, CSIRO does all sorts of work in, in climate change, zero emission houses, uh, we're actually, hopefully, in a, a year or so, going to be literally building, I've seen two descriptions of this, either the world's largest 
supercomputer. It certainly has to be one of the world's largest supercomputers based in Perth. This uh, computer, of course, will be taking the feed from what is also going to be the world's largest radio telescope, um, which will uh, cover a distance of uh, 6,000 kilometres. It's actually going to be thousands of individual telescopes all set up. Very exciting project. And uh, in its first six hours of live feed, once they switch it on, it will receive more data than has been received in the entire history of mankind in the area of radio telescopes. But of course they need to build a big box to take this feed. Supercomputers use massive amounts of energy and um, what I'm really hoping is that SIRO will be successful in um, uh, tapping into geothermal uh, heat sources literally immediately below where this su supercomputer is housed and uh, of course not have to then rely upon a grid and burning coal. But I wasn't asked to talk about that. What I was really asked to talk about was where is contemporary corporate thinking going? Um, the world of corporations is often taken for granted. It provides the vast bulk of the goods and services that we come to expect. Certainly in this country, it provides the vast bulk of employment opportunities. It, uh, of course, is either directly or indirectly the main source of taxation, which enables our entire government sector to exist. And uh, if you look around the world over the last 10 or 20 years, it's actually, or commerce, has lifted more people out of abject poverty than the combined efforts of uh, Multilat and, uh, and the whole aid agency industry. Having said that, um, it is on most measures, and the surveys come out regularly, treated with derision by so much of society. And uh, I, for one, have been interested in that particular issue for, uh, for many, many years. In fact, I've occasionally been involved in all sorts of things trying to connect business with the community and perhaps uh, deal in a small way with this issue of derision. I actually want to tell a, a little story, the relevance of which might become obvious a bit later. but. Um, in Melbourne, we have, possibly as in, in Brisbane, um, uh, different socioeconomic groups living in different parts of the broader city. And our lowest socioeconomic area, if you like, is in Melbourne's west. Uh, about eight, nine years ago, there was being organised a group of um, little buses, you know, mini buses, and, and the idea was to take uh, senior business people from Melbourne in and around the western suburbs and to see a variety of different community organisations doing fabulous work. And uh, I was, I'd actually been privy to this before and uh, my job was actually to invite a number of my senior business people to come along on this trip, open their eyes, have an experience they hadn't had before. And um, so I did that and that was fine and uh, we set out on this afternoon, three hours, fascinating three hours, we went to an asylum seekers refugee um, base and uh, out to a, a prison, uh, one or two other places. And we ended up at a, uh, a centre that was run by an arm of the Catholic Church called Good Shepherd. And basically they just worked with, um, you know, people who did it tough in that part of Melbourne. Uh, what they pr did that, that during their session was basically uh, not to stand up and tell us what they did. They actually got two or three of the, uh, the family or the, the people that they were helping to stand up and tell their stories through their eyes and that was actually probably a more effective way of getting the message across. Anyway, I didn't really need to listen to these stories because I'd been involved in this sector for a while, I'd heard it all before and I was actually more interested that um, the people that I had invited, the you know other CEOs of companies and what have you, that they were sitting up the front that they heard firsthand what these extraordinary experiences might be. Anyway, this um, woman got up towards the end. Uh, she seemed to be probably in her late 20s. Uh, she didn't speak English very well. And as her story unfolded, it became obvious that she'd come from um, Bosnia. And uh, she'd emigrated a few years before with a very, very young family. Uh, at one stage, I think they had four under the age of five, a couple of twins. 
But they'd seen the horrors of, um, uh, I guess, the, uh, the, the extermination of so many people in Bosnia in a way that she didn't really want to share with us, but it had clearly had an enormous impact on her. Indeed, her husband had clearly had some sort of breakdown. He was no longer in the family household and she didn't know where he was. And uh, this woman was just trying to eke out an existence she didn't speak English very well. She had difficulty dealing with Centrelink. She didn't have many friends in the community. And um, she was very reliant on organisations like Good Shepherd. And, uh, you know, as she unfolded her story, for me, it was um, terrific initially seeing the people I'd invited along. They were so attentive and they were really taking it all in. And then, one by one, a remarkable thing happened because uh, I don't think any of us really wanted to do it, but we all ended up weeping, crying. Uh, even including the guy at the back, which was me, that had kind of heard all this before and didn't really need to tune in, but it was so affecting. Um, business, as I said a moment ago, is on all these surveys so often treated with derision. I wonder what the reasons for that is. Well. Sometimes there are bad eggs, there are rogues in business. But I don't think that's the answer because there are actually rogues in just about every walk of life. I spend a lot of time in the non-for-profit sector and I think there are some bad eggs in there, bad eggs in government. Um, I don't think that's the answer itself. But I have to say that as a business person, I do think that business goes out of its way to be seen to be self-interested. It's forever... Um, asking for things, for a better tax system, for a better IR system. Um, obviously, business has um, a certain amount of very high salaries, and it's no wonder, when you think about it, that the survey results come out in the way that they do. Um, Michael Porter is a distinguished business academic based in Harvard, and uh, he says... You know, business is very, very short-sighted if it thinks that it can maximise profit, and I want to come back to that in a moment, if it can maximise profit in an environment where it is treated with disdain. Um, now, on the subject of making a profit, I'm one who says business should never, ever be embarrassed about saying that it is interested in making a profit. Obviously, there's a legal requirement under the Corporations Act here in, in Australia for, indeed, profit to be uh, um, a, a very, very important motive of boards meeting around their tables. It's uh, fairly unambiguous. Uh, businesses, particularly publicly listed ones, owned by tens of thousands of shareholders, um, are not allowed to be charities, whether they liked it or not. But I think what um, Porter is saying is that whilst one shouldn't be embarrassed about talking publicly about the importance of making a return on capital invested, it is quite another thing to operate in a way whereby, for some reason, the community doesn't seem to gel and get a warm and fuzzy feeling about business. And um, he's developed a response, if you like, around a term called shared value. I'm not big on terms because actually I've seen over probably two or three decades a number of different um, uh, phrases and what have you used. But I think they all lead to the same end, namely, and he does put it very eloquently nowadays, he says, what business needs to do, and I thoroughly support this, is not to be seen out there just narrowly producing goods and services, making a profit, returning a dividend to shareholders, when actually the rest of the community has typically fundamental, insoluble, ongoing problems. Business actually needs to come here and be part of the problem-solving group. Um, it needs to, um, you know, basically be part of the solution, not just someone off the side pointing out that there's a problem all the time. I'm actually in complete agreement, and indeed I think that uh, not only can that be done in a way which in no way compromises the profit motive, but actually ends up making for a much better business, a much more sustainable business, particularly having regard for a new generation coming through. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, 
There are many ways in which corporations can become part of the solution. I want to start with actually the most difficult way, the way that much of the community is often disappointed about but I need to deal with. Um, I think with your top 10 listed public company, these are the giants in the land, I understand that for every 400 applications for a cash support of some cause or charity or organisation, only one is selected. On that sort of data, you'd have to say that the corporate world is pretty stingy. Well, let me approach it another way. Around the board tables, and this is not typically talked about publicly, but the, the boards of the larger companies find it very difficult to set aside more than 1% of net profit after tax by way of cash donation to community organisations. That's a rule of thumb. As I said, you won't read about it terribly much, but um, my experience around board tables is that 1% is a level which um, uh, won't raise the ire of the Australian Shareholders Association and all the institutions that are so ready to get on the phone to the CEO and chairman, pointing out when the company does something wrong, um, but can actually be a meaningful amount of money in gross terms. Having said all that, the difficulty is that uh, many of these corporations are very high profile very well known to all of us. And it seems obvious that we'll write a letter to them expecting that they will support a cause, not actually knowing that indeed because of their profile they're literally receiving tens of thousands of applications every week and um, they're actually stuck with this 1% of NPAT rule. But there's, um, I think, some other low-hanging fruit. It might be a bit more hidden, but it's certainly low-hanging. Firstly, corporations are organisations replete with all sorts of resources. They have IT departments, marketing departments, people that invest heavily in strategy, the list goes on and on and on. And if you're in the community sector and wired in to the corporate sector, this sort of resource, which is often built to withstand peak loads, any of you in the IT industry know that it's not necessarily a uniform load in a 12-month period, and there will be times when the IT department actually is able to give of itself. And that many of the more switched on in the charitable sector have outstanding, actually, IT systems that have been largely supported by big business, albeit at times when big business has been able to provide some of its slack. And those uh, examples go on and on and on, whether it's, as I said before, in the marketing area, HR, you know, whatever. And... Um, that is good for a whole bunch of reasons. It's great for the, uh, the employees and the corporation itself. They're actually seeing with their own eyes how they can um, not only assist their own employer, but obviously to give back to the broader community and they're playing to their strengths. Um, the Australian Shareholders Association doesn't actually see it. Now, it's not as if the corporation is trying to hide it, but it just doesn't have to disclose it in the same way as an outright cash donation, perhaps. Uh, and, um, you know, this area of, or th this whole issue of understanding really what a corporate is able to give in a way that doesn't cause it too much grief is something that I keep encouraging the, the non-for-profit industry, look, really get ahead of the wave because there's a huge amount to be gained here. If the corporation itself is limited with this 1% of, of NPAT, um, you only have to add up the combined incomes of the senior management teams, which are now publicly disclosed, though, to know that there is extraordinary wealth being paid to corporate executives in this country. And there ought to be an expectation that they themselves, which will not be limited to some sort of artificial 1% rule, are uh, in a, um, a terrific position to provide cash as well, as well as all the other employees to the extent that they can. Porter says that this phenomenon of the corporation being part of the problem-solving uh, exercise, if you like, is really catching on in, uh, in, in, at the big end of town in, in the US. Now, I'm no authority. I've, I visit the US every now and then, but I can't say that I walk up and down and live in that space. But I think he's right. What I do read, and uh, we had out here just recently, uh, the CEO of the world's largest uh, industrial conglomerate, Jeffrey Imelt, and uh, he spoke um, to a, a couple of dinners that I was at in, um, in Melbourne. 
And he spoke very naturally about corporations nowadays taking responsibility for community problems. They've got a particular interest in, um, in alternative energy. And uh, when I heard him speak, I had to say he spoke in ways that um, I don't see too many Australian CEOs talking yet. I think their time might come in the future. One thing I do want to say, though, about the corporate, and that is that um, it ought... Uh, some of you may be familiar with the term corporate social responsibility. And there has been a trend in the last uh, couple of decades or so to set up CSR departments. And sometimes I grieve for two reasons. Firstly, I don't act, I'm not big into words and terms and phrases and what have you, but the word responsibility in corporate social responsibility to me is just kind of all wrong, uh, in that actually this stuff that we're talking about ought to be mainstream corporate. It's not just um, that it's done out of guilt or some social responsibility. I think there's a more effective way of going about it. But, um, but the thing that really irks me is that so often a smallish department has been set up in the bowels of the organisation, headed up by someone who can only be described as junior or, uh, yeah, junior or at most junior media management, and something nice is written in the annual report about it and some glossy photos about people painting something that's probably been painted ten times in the previous two years, and, you know, with the idea being that the company has honoured its corporate social responsibility. This whole area doesn't start in the bowels of the organisation with um, junior management running it. It actually starts in the CEO, CEO's office. It's mainstream activity. It's vital to the health, well-being and sustainability of the organisation. And if the leadership, if the board, chairman, CEO doesn't get this, then I, for one, would never probably want to hold shares in such an organisation because I think in the ensuing future it will become uncompetitive. Why do I say that? What I've been trying to say is not just a mere academic treatise. Um, there is, particularly in this country, a shortage of skilled talent. Not everywhere, but um, in, the, in the businesses that I know, there is a huge fight. There's enormous demand for the best of the best coming through out of our universities, Gen Y, Gen Z. And I love this new generation. I'm privileged to sit on the board of, uh, on the uh, Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee in Victoria and every year for two or three days I get to see the best of the best coming through. And uh, they make people like me think about what I was like 30 years ago and just pale, frankly, into insignificance when I think about what we're really producing nowadays. It's quite awe-inspiring. But this new generation also knows that they're hot property. And indeed they are. Um, this year has been a very special year for me. I'm actually out literally every night participating in this, officiating at that, talking at that. I've actually been coming back to my office quite often at about 10 o'clock at night. I work in an industry where people do work a bit round the clock, but when I get back to my office at 10 o'clock at night, um, it's not people my age who are in there, it's the 25-year-olds and the 30-year-olds. Not many 35-year-olds, they've actually gone. They typically have their families nowadays. They might have to do a bit of work from home, but it's the young ones that are in the office. And they don't hesitate to tell me what they think about the world, about life, about the corporation that they're working for. And if they don't connect with the vibe of the organisation, they're not going to hang around. And I wouldn't want them to. Um, and accordingly, any corporation today that thinks that it's just enough to pay an employee a weekly pay packet and offer them a promotion or two down the track simply doesn't get what this new generation is wanting. They want something, I believe, in their employment existence that's a whole lot broader than that. And indeed, they want to be associated and work for a, an organisation that's doing its bit to solve society's problems. They're, they're, they're going to be expecting senior management to raise its head above the parapet, whereas in, so often in the past, business leaders have been timid in even in joining in a public debate about some insoluble problem, whether it's climate change or refugees or whatever. I'm seeing a Gen Y, Gen Z that says, 
Why not? We're all in this together. Similarly, the consuming public is becoming far more discerning with uh, the web, social media and what have you. I think um, you know, the vibe of a company as I'm describing it is going to be increasingly more important as time goes on as well. Can I just briefly give you an example of um, something that I find quite extraordinary um, and inspiring. I'm involved in a little organisation called Business for Millennium Development. Its focus is not here on Australia. Its focus is to actually take Australian companies and inspire them, encourage them to um, do what they do best, namely be business people, offer business services, goods and what have you, but in a developing world, a third world environment. And the idea is really simple. It's win-win. Business gets a new market, finds a new place to establish business, and at the same time, because what it does, it does well, it helps um, a local, typically very poor community. Um, one of our biggest projects at the moment is um, in one of the hardest places in the world, I think, to get stuff done, our nearest northern neighbour, Papua New Guinea. There's a massive um, liquid na uh, natural gas project occurring there, anchored by three large uh, petroleum organisations, ExxonMobil, Santos and Oil Search. The project itself is based in the Southern Highlands, a very, very remote part of PNG. Uh, up until recently, the only way into the Southern Highlands other than air was through a very, very long route uh, fr from the north. But as a result of this major, major project, a very large road for the first time has been built from the southern coast. That's to get obviously all the big equipment up to where it's needed. One of those joint venture partners, Oil Search, has actually been in Papua New Guinea for, for many years. And um, it was faced with a choice. It could have actually made a decision to put a great big barbed wire fence around all of this project and pay a quarterly royalty check to the Moresby government. Um, the Samari government is not a government that rates well um, in terms of governance, etc. It said, look, we've obviously got to pay a certain amount of royalty, but we know what to do. We know what to complete, or we know what to satisfy our, our obligation, if you like, entirely by way of that royalty. And they've embarked on something, I think, which is quite extraordinary and still work in progress. They're doing it in a hard place, but they've certainly got our full support to, uh, to see it through to the end. And that is that so many of the people who live up in the Southern Highlands are actually damn good vegetable produce growers. They've been doing that for hundreds, thousands of years. They do it very well. It's actually quite a fertile place to grow various things. And All Search has done something it, hadn't, it didn't need to do. Seeing that road, that piece of infrastructure in place, what All Search has gone out to do now is to organise for a whole supply chain to enable, for the very first time, the export of those vegetables and indeed the receipt by the local community of cash. It's never happened before. It doesn't happen overnight though because we need to uh, go to packaging companies and get developed new packaging that will actually suit the local conditions, um, the particular produce that we've packed into it, etc. We've needed to talk to uh, a supply chain and logistics company that can actually do the job in a hostile place. And there are a whole lot of other um, boxes that need to be ticked as well. All Search didn't have to do this. I say again, it could have just put up a big fence, kept the local community out, paid a cheque to a Samari government and sucked the gas out there for the next 30 years. But it's decided largely because of the view of the employees inside the organisation who said, look, surely there's something we can do for these local people that are going to make them feel better about life and make us feel better about life as well. Um, it's a case of probably two steps forward, one step back. It's a, a massive undertaking, what's happening, not just the LNG project, but this particular initiative I've described. I'm very hopeful, however, that uh, over the next couple of years it will become a reality. This year, um, as I mentioned before, is an amazing year for me. I'm um, having the privilege to talk and uh, basically say things that I think 
are important. Unlike five of my six predecessors who were academic giants, uh, people like Patrick McGorry last year, your own Ian Fraser, of course, who's found a cure for cervical cancer, I'm really just a jack of all trades. Um, I'm passionate about many, many different causes, but could hardly be regarded as a giant in any one. But I have this very simple message. It's a message for all Australians that um, we have this large non-for-profit sector and it does all the stuff that neither business nor government is interested or capable in doing and without it, life simply wouldn't be as we've come to expect it. It collects all those people that fall between society's cracks. And I'm saying to everyone that, you know, for those of us who do have choice as to how we spend our time, as to how we spend our money, add to that range of choices an active involvement in the non-for-profit sector. There is a cause for us all, and that's important, because if the cause doesn't gel with us, I'm saying don't get involved. Don't get involved out of guilt or some sort of sense of responsibility, because I think we'll run out of puff sooner rather than later. But when we get involved in something that just makes every bit of sense to the person for whom we are, then it takes off. Play to our strengths, I mentioned that before. Um, these IT departments that uh, lend their assistance to the charitable sector, um, it's difficult to measure sometimes the extraordinary value that they're adding. And in particular, I'm saying whether we're eight or 80, uh, in fact, I was at a function last night in Melbourne, there was a fellow turning 100 next Monday. He uh, came in a wheelchair and uh, one stage he had to stand up to receive something and two people lifted him up, etc. But, you know, he didn't have to be there last night. Probably part of him didn't want to be. But I made the point that uh, even the fact that he had given of himself and come to this amazing occasion allowed himself to inspire a whole lot of other people was just another form, another way in which we can give. And uh, I've been saying whether we're eight or 80, or indeed last night, a fellow who was almost 100, there's always something we can do. And why am I passionate about this? Because in my own experience, what we get back is always a whole lot more than what we give. I'll conclude just by talking about well-being um, at two levels. Globally, well-being, there's a thing called a World Well-Being Index. I can't recall who, who runs it, but um, it looks at the well-being of nations as a whole. And there is no close correlation between a country's economic growth, its GDP, and its well-being, interestingly. There's a much stronger correlation between the giving that occurs inside that country, the extent to which volunteering is a force, and indeed, interestingly, the amount of overseas aid that it gives and well-being. And that particular study, if you like, also resonates at a local level, at an individual level. Here in Australia, we have an organisation, Australian Unity, which produces its own wellbeing index, looking at individuals in Australia on a regular basis. And again, once one gets to a certain income level, such that there's food on the table and shelter and clothing, there's no longer a great correlation between increasing wellbeing and increasing wealth, but a very strong correlation between giving back, volunteering, being part of the community. And for a baby girl born this morning, I don't know what the stats are here in Brisbane, but in, a, in one of Melbourne's better hospitals, uh, she will have a, an average life expectancy today of 103 and eight months. And I've got to say, life is no longer a sprint, it's clearly a marathon. And this idea of feeling good about ourselves, feeling happy and content, well-being, um, we are being told very starkly that at whatever stage of life we are, whether we're pretending to be seriously busy by being the CEO of a large organisation or not so busy, whether we're old or young, this idea of actually connecting with community is actually important for our own well-being. Can I just finish very quickly with that young lady's story, Ludmilla? Um, I went up to her afterwards and had expressed my admiration for her courage at having told 
her tough story to a whole lot of boring people that were wearing suits and we probably looked fairly stern and what have you, but she'd absolutely broken any barriers that we'd brought in to that room and uh, I just said I was amazed at what she was able to do and one thing led to another, we got talking and I guess over the last eight years, we haven't done very much, but every year she comes away on a holiday down to the Mornington Peninsula in a little place that we've got down there. And over those last seven or eight years, I've seen this extraordinary mother who just cares for her four young children so much. Um, you know, she doesn't speak English particularly well nowadays. She's still absolutely reliant on Centrelink and the other agencies that I talked about earlier. But nevertheless, she's as good as a mum as I've ever seen anywhere. And um, the fact is that, you know, she sometimes says, thank you so much for, you know, what we've done for her, which is not really very much at all. But she will go to her grave never, ever understanding what she's actually done for us. To share her story, to uh, hear a little bit more about the horrors that she's endured over her lifetime and with such limited resources, being such an outstanding mum and without any shadow of doubt guaranteeing her kids' futures to be a whole lot sounder than her own has been inspirational for, uh, for my family. And as I said, she will never probably get it, but uh, what she's given us is a whole lot more than what we've given her. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Now, I think we, the volunteers are hitting the microphones and um, we'll open the uh, meeting up to some questions. And um, if you just raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to ask uh, Simon a question and, uh, and wait, wait till we get a microphone to you because uh, that's essential for the recording part of the process. It's not working. It's OK, tech Some, support is on its way. Someone's running. I'm very grateful for the opportunity of asking a question to the Australian of the Year 2011. The title of this uh, gathering today is Inclusive Australia. According to statistics, there are 44 million unemployed in the world. We also have an obligation under the United Nations International Law Framework. So while I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, and I thank the speaker for being here today, there are 600,000 not-for-profit organizations in Australia. There are 620 thousand unemployed in Australia, therefore doing the maths, should every not-for-profit employ only one jobless, that would make a great difference. There are 24 million unemployed in Europe, there are 14 million unemployed in the USA as we speak. Not all of these individuals might have the privilege to stand where I stand now. So I ask the speaker to comment on this. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not sure that I'm going to do a very good job at responding to your question. You're talking about, um, and I, I suspect your numbers actually understate the true extent of the world's unemployed. I've been privileged to spend quite a bit of time in the third world and in places where statistics simply um, aren't kept. But, but nevertheless, how can I respond? Well, um, look, I think work is such a basic right, and if we start here in this country, um, we, on one hand, have a level of unemployment that a typical economist would say is insignificant, um, but on the, and indeed there are labour shortages in certain parts of, of the country, including uh, in parts of your state. But having said all that, um, what does concern me, and um, I gave a paper just a couple of weeks ago 
to the Australian Academy of Science on our future population trends. And um, I guess the controversial part of my paper was that um, I was concerned that it was uh, not a particularly good strategy on Australia's part to simply satisfy our perceived um, demand for employment, particularly skilled employment, just by forever bringing migrants in. Now, let me just say before I go any further, I love multiculturalism. I grew up in, a, in the most multicultural part of Melbourne. Uh, my state school had 50 different ethnicities involved in it. It just runs through my veins. But I was more concerned about this country as a whole. And I think that um, there are two or three areas that we can work much harder to reduce the 600,000 that you were talking about a moment ago. Those three areas are this. Firstly, um, I think in the business world, we simply don't make it easy enough for women to get the employment that they're seeking. And that's been the case for as long as I've been in the business world. Um, you know, as humans, we all have our different needs of the workforce. The fact that I actually don't uh, carry and deliver a child um, doesn't mean that I don't have particular needs and what have you from the workforce. And I've never really understood why we are so female unfriendly. And all I know is that um, if we were just a bit smarter in business, government, whatever, um, we could actually open up a resource, get more people, more women working on, on a term, on a basis that they were happy with. The second is that I mentioned that statistic before about the young baby girl being born this morning in Melbourne, living to 103 and eight months. That's actually happening in a very, or relatively quick um, time frame from a, a species point of view. Um, if one takes the view that we're typically educated now by the time we're in our early 20s, um, and yet, and we may well peak in terms of managerial responsibility in our 40s or early 50s, the guy that's running BHP was appointed in his young 40s, um, but then follows, I would argue strongly, a period of nowadays a good 40 years where potentially we as a species may not want to work uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week, mortgages paid off. Um, we don't want to work crazy hours, but we actually still want to make a productive contribution back to the workforce and indeed a number of other areas of life as well. But it's not just a few short years. I think we're actually looking as a species now at being potentially 30 or 40 years. Some people call it the ageing workforce and some people see it as a problem. I'm sorry, I don't see it just as a problem. I see it as an extraordinary resource. But just like I was trying to say with the issue of women in the workforce, business employers generally need to get wise and smart about what is the right way to get the best out of these extraordinarily experienced people who will lead longer and active, and if Patrick McGorry gets his way last year, lives where even our minds keep up with it as well. And finally, the third area is, um, and, and something very close to my heart this year, is those with disabilities. The, uh, I won't take your time now, but we're having a major, major debate this year as a nation as to whether we have a national disability insurance scheme. At the moment, if you have a disability like my older sister, who spent too many minutes in the birth canal and uh, ended up having a, an intellectual age no better than 12, she's not funded for much. Whereas if her same disability had arisen out of a motor car accident, she'd be fully funded. So it's a, a funny system we have in this country. Nevertheless, um, it may well be over the next year or two that the federal government decides to bring in a national disability insurance scheme. One of the many byproducts of such a scheme will be again, surprise, surprise, more people into the, into the workforce. Those 600,000 you're talking about, and the many who choose not to put themselves down on the list because they know that that might be futile, particularly women, um, I actually think, I'm well, I'm actually quite passionate about exploring um, how many of them can we open up before we need to actually bring in skilled migration from overseas, and I'm not talking about refugees, I'm talking about skilled migration in relation to which there's a very competitive market right around the world. We're not actually doing 
a whole lot of people a favour when we bring skilled migrants here. There are actually opportunities for them in other parts of the world as well, not refugees so much. Oh, hello. Um, oh, sorry. Um, my name's Trish. I'm a student at Griffith University um, in environmental management. And um, I was quite interested that, you know, CSR, um, Corporate Social Responsibility, came up all through your talk. Mm. Um, but then I was um, surprised at the end um, when you were talking about the natural gas um, new facility in the southern highlands of Papua New Guinea. Um, and you mentioned that um, the, the kind of the good of putting in a big road and that the agricultural skills that they had harnessed over many, many thousands of years would now be able to see export and cash coming in and that that was linked to the theme of corporate social responsibility. Um, and talk of you know all the essentials, packaging, and how you do all you know scientifically hygiene and you know mm. um, best for trade. Um, and uh, but you didn't mention, and I'd, I would like you to comment on that if that's okay. Um, the other essential part of corporate social responsibility um, is in this case the maintenance of cultural integrity. And as we've seen throughout the world with colonialism, the the disestablishment, the, the change in power structures within communities and how that is extremely disorienting and um, mm. inefficient and creates a negative, um, if unless you, you deal with it, it creates a whole array of negative mm. effects that actually decrease the efficiency of a society, of a community. And um, with the... It, it, it does seem to me quite... Um, uh, self-interested that this this company wants a marketplace and trade near where their plant is for their empl their employees to get the benefits from you know um, from a system that fits with the company so with a commercial capitalist trade system so they want to bring in the road change the community to help them by giving them cash which as you said hasn't been a large part of these communities in the past. Um, what uh, cultural um, kind of workforce or programs do you know that the, the company is doing to ensure that the community that they're seeking to change into their commercial, commercially oriented um, kind of part of their mm. system. Mm. What are they doing to... Good question. Yeah. The gas was actually found about 40 years ago. And um, I think... You know, I wasn't around there 40 years ago, but the, the story I've heard is that this desire to, um, uh, to have the produce exported was very much a desire from the local people. In fact, whilst many of us throw our hands up in dismay at why Papua New Guinea is in the state that it's in, uh, really complex, sad. Uh, in this particular area, there are actually a number of what they call um, quite strong landowner groups. These are you know, purely the indigenous people and they've formed themselves into landowner groups over many years. As I said, the gas was actually discovered decades ago but only became viable to exploit, if you like, on a Western basis in recent years. But the local people had been talking for years about the idea of trying to export their crops. It wasn't pushed at all by the Europeans, by the Westerners. It was actually them. And it was only when the road went in that the locals said, oh, now we've actually got a chance of, of getting it out. Now, I think that the locals did need the support of the, the oil majors, if you like, to bring in these other logistics companies, packaging companies, the, the scientists to actually develop what has to be a special system that works in that part of the world. Um, but as I understand it, the, you know, I've met a few of them, the, the local people seem, you know, that's really what they wanted. It's not been inflicted on them. And certainly, I mean, I don't like using this word CSR, as I said in the, in the, in the talk, but the, 
the instigation for all of this has absolutely come from the locals. Um, and Oil Search itself, which is the main joint venture party pushing this particular project, just said, gee, well, it sounds a good idea to us. I mean, it might take a whole lot of time and effort and it might be two steps forward, one step back, but we're so much more attracted to this than just paying this big cheque to a corrupt Somari government. Um, I do absolutely resonate with what you're saying, though, in that um, there are too many examples around the world where we've just knocked the stuffing out of local cultural traditions. And, you know, when the big business end of town has, has met up um, in a very unsympathetic way with, uh, you know, with local peoples, we've seen awful things happen all the time over so many years. I think what's happening here in the Southern Highlands is about as world's best practices I could find. But um, then again, will it be perfect? No, it won't. I'm sure it won't. I think that, um, you know, when the local people... Th there will be small groups. There will be, I'm sure, individuals in that, uh, in that culture who said, we, I wish we'd never ever seen, you know, the, the first drilling rig come in. Um, <coughs> sorry, so... Um... Well, actually, we... Probably should give, we've only got about a couple of minutes left, so we probably should All give right. a chance to some other people to ask a question. Thank you, though. Here, there, and then we'll probably have to wrap up, I think. Um, you mentioned earlier in your talk that you were talking about well-being and profit or, or well-being in the corporate world, and coming into what you were talking about before, can you talk about uh, different ways of working, so well-being at work? You were mentioning mm. before that you know, I have a couple of parents who are engineers um, and they're in the 60s mm. and they enjoy beginning work at 11 o'clock after coffee. Mm. Um, they still want to work. They still want to have a, a contribution, but they want to work differently. Mm. And in fact, I know a lot of people who want to work differently and I think it's really crucial to our well-being. I, look, I'm passionate about this. I, um, I feel as if I'm on a... Uh, <laughs> uh, a journey by myself sometimes, but look, 15 years ago I didn't need to work anymore. I actually really liked working though, but I had so many other things I wanted to do. There was this wonderful non-for-profit sector which had great causes in it, and, um, and I simply said to my employer, look, uh, the choice is yours. Um, I, I'd like to work here half time, if that's okay with you, but if it doesn't work for you, um, then, you know, I've had a great ride and you know, see you later. And they said, um, and in truth, I'd recruited virtually all these people anyway, so they're probably being nice to me. <laughs> but but they actually, but they're tough investment bankers, so they weren't going to be sycophantic either. But uh, they said, look, ah, let's give it a go. Um, you know, for three months, and uh, you know, there are not too many part-time investment bankers around. But nevertheless, um, you know, I had to give and take a bit. They had to give and take. Um, they did say, look, let's review it after three months. We've never had that three-month review. You know, it just seemed to work. And, um, but sometimes it has felt like a bit of a, a sole crusade. There are some professions, and I've got a son that's uh, embarking off as an engineer, um, that, 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 that I think are a bit prehistoric. They're not, they're not yet getting what I'm... Look, there's a, there's a large accounting firm national, international accounting firm, I don't know what its practice is internationally, but its practice in its Melbourne office is to uh, retire off partners at the age of 53. Um, why? Because uh, they have a perception, and I challenge them, I just think they're absolutely wrong, that um, you know, once people hit their 50s, they're not actually looking to work harder. Now, I agree with that bit. And the 35 and 40-year-old aspiring partners who are just you know, working crazy hours around the clock, um, think, and I think quite incorrectly, that uh, there isn't room in that place for anyone over 53. That organisation is losing serious talent year in, year out. I think they've got the blinkers on. I think they could actually grow their vi business um, and, and all they have to do is actually adapt. If they don't adapt, I think they will be overtaken by other organisations. It may not be next year, it might not be in 10 years, but as I said, these young guys that I come back to my office and talk with at 10 o'clock at night, um, they're fierce, they, they couldn't care less what I think about their views. Um, they ba they'll back themselves and this next generation coming through will not tolerate um, the overly rigid thinking that I sometimes see in the business, for, in the business world. 
Hi, Simon. Um, you, you gave us some good insights into the, uh, the corporate world and the fact they can give 1%, but the sort of constraints they're under. Um, we could probably also talk about the not-for-profit world and the way that they have to operate, and we have the, obviously the government sector and um, CSIRO and the sort of the good work you do there, but I'm sure you've got your own sort of uh, constraints to work within. Um, with these sort of three sectors and the, and the various sort of business mm. models they're working with, um, do you think those models are good enough to solve the problems we're facing? Um, or do we need to reinvent the models and the, uh, and the sectors? Yeah, look, I, I'm not very good at reinventing models. It's, it's where we've got to. But what I'm passionate about is trying to break down the barriers between them. There are excellent people in each of those places. And frankly, you know, the jack of all trades I referred to, or I described myself before, what I really love doing is connecting dots. They are three different tribes, in, in a way, um, and I don't want to generalise at all, but the fact is that the best of business is all about efficiency, long run, scale, doing things with precision, Gantt charts, you know, da 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 da. The best aspects of the non-for-profit uh, sector, and, and don't get me wrong, it has quite a lot of that as well, but what I really see in the non-for-profit sector, quite often lacking in business, is just passion, is drive, is raw energy, is just getting really excited about making something happen. You go to the government, it actually sees it through a different lens again. It has, um, you know, it, it feels a responsibility for bringing as many along in the community as possible, um, having to cover all those complicated bases that we expect of a government. And I think it does, uh, I mean, I don't want to, actually, I, I don't have a new plan for society. I'm, I'm, only around for 70 years, but, um, but, but I, I am passionate about trying to get the best of each of those sectors working together. And I've been privileged to see, and I've really had nothing to do with the actual operation, but every now and then I've you know, serendipitously joined some, some dots together, and it has been spectacular. Not always, sometimes the chemistry isn't there, but um, to get the best of the best working with each other and cutting down those tribal barriers, for me, is, um, is nirvana. I'm sorry we can't take any more questions. I've already become known as the bad facilitator for letting things go on over time all the time. Um, but I'm sure it's, not, it's unsurprising there's so many people keen to ask questions after an address such as we've had this afternoon. Can I ask you to thank Simon McKeon, please? Thank you, Simon.